Hi there, my name's Chris Can with Aspermont and MiningNews.net. With me, I have Sean Russo, who's with Noah's Rule. Uh, Sean, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. At the moment, gold's going on a bit of a run. Obviously, you're a hedging expert. How's your advice for your clients in this type of environment? How does it differ? Uh, well, I think the first thing I'd say is that to the extent that um, hedging on occasion gets a bad name uh, in the industry, one of the things I would say is we always say to our clients, the reason you're hedging is not to do with price or today's price. Um, the larger reason you're hedging is to create certainty into the future. So obviously the higher the price is, and at the moment the prices are high, and with Contango they're higher, you don't have to do a lot of hedging to make a significant difference to the level of certainty you've got next year, the year after. You know, these are fantastic prices. Australian producers locking in $3,400, $3,500 mm. an ounce, even the way costs have come up lately, you don't have to do too much hedging at that level to really push down what we call your point of pain. You know, the price that you might have to tolerate if prices went down, if we had a 2013 type event. So I think that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing is that the cost of hedging, measured with hindsight, everyone likes to judge mining companies with hindsight, the cost of hedging has to be measured against the value of dilution avoided. So that's the biggest thing for us. I mean, why are companies generally doing hedging, the good companies, the companies that you see that do it successfully and still go on, they're doing it to minimise the number of shares they issue. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at companies here that are going to go into project finance or something at some stage in the future, why would they contemplate hedging? Why would they contemplate locking the price in when everyone tells you it's going to go higher? Because if it is going to go higher, you want to have as few shares on issue as possible. You want to repay that debt as fast as you can. Debt is easier to come by. I thought it was really interesting today, Rick Rule this morning, he talked about uranium. And it seems perfectly acceptable for them to say the cost of capital will be lower. Everything we got, all these uranium companies need to do is they need to lock in a collar with an off-taker. And it was like that was going to be a whole new thing, like no one's ever been able to do that before. Gold producers have always been able to do that. So in some ways, what they're recommending, what Rick Rule's recommending uranium guys do, is really what gold guys have been doing for a long time. They've been able to take that advantage that you have a customer that will buy you know, long-term contracts. In that case, it's a government. I'm sorry, it's banks rather than, than government entities or, or the producers, the you consumers. Say, you say, Sean, that's what gold producers have been doing or are able to do. Yeah. They don't always do it, though. And there's a lot of investor pressure from certain investor groups not to, not to hedge. How, how does that look today? Is there more understanding about how hedging should fit into a contemporary financing mix? And how do you see hedging in a contemporary yeah. financing mix? Well, I, look, the, the, I think it's harder for mining for gold mining companies to get to get financing from banks now than it was in the past. I, I believe, for, for many reasons, most of which I don't agree with, that banks kind of really bought into, uh, well, senior people in the banks, not the people we deal with at banks, but their bosses, bought into the ESG thing in a really big way. And I think someone touched up on the stage this morning, this idea that, you know, gold's not any good because we dig it out of the ground, we burn carbon to do it, to put it back in a, in a hole in the ground. Um, yeah, this is crazy. I mean, gold has a very, a very um, essential place in the world economy. I mean, gold really is the thing that keeps governments and central bankers honest at the end of the day. That, that's my view. And so you look at it in that context, banks kind of were saying, I need to preserve capital to finance lithium. I need to preserve capital to finance copper. Gold got pushed down somewhere near coal. In terms of, you know, really, I think that's, there's, you know, I don't agree with that, but I, I, I see that. And so to that extent, there are fewer people lending to gold mining companies today. But the ones that still will do that are the people that still say, well, I need to understand the certainty that comes with some level of hedging. The key to getting it right is getting the right level of hedging. And that's really where what we do with our clients is we say to most of our clients, our clients, I believe, and you look at Perseus, uh, former client Northern Star, Romelius, Silver Lake, Red Five, these are all people that we've worked with. These companies have all been successful and certainly the longer day ones like Perseus mm. through the cycle. You can't find any of Perseus's peers from back in the 2010, 2011, 2012 period. I mean, any other ASX company that was one of Perseus's peers that was a Australian domiciled foreign miner, they blew up somewhere along the way because they borrowed money and they didn't hedge or they blew up their capital register repaying debt with equity when, when the price went down. So I think there's lots of good examples of um, mining companies that have used it successfully. When you look into those companies and you look at the way they operate, you will see that they are behaving like owners and not like agents. 
they're, 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 they're saying, how do I keep my business going through the cycle, not how do I keep it until the next time I get to exercise some options? You know, and I think that's the big difference between North America and Australia. You know, there's almost no examples in North America, very few of companies that have sort of successfully project financed themselves, used hedging, kept their registers very tight. They tend to go back to the market, you know, more and more paper in the market. There's a few exceptions. Um, people we've worked with over there, like Artemis, you look at, you know, they're making new all-time record highs, defying the Lasson curve. They haven't built their mine yet. They've got a sensible level of hedging. Investors have looked at that and gone, great. The gearing that they are able to get off of fairly low market capitalization has been what's made those shares so valuable. They didn't issue a whole lot of shares when they were pre-finance or to, 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 to finance. Sean, we're asking everyone what their view is on 2024 in terms of investment trends um, and where people should be positioning, et cetera. I might slant it slightly differently for you and ask, how do you see companies positioning themselves or what should investors be looking for in companies that are positioning themselves to manage their risks as a long-term business? Yeah, I look, from a personal investing perspective and from the way we kind of talk to our, our clients, and certainly our clients don't take advice based on my personal investment, but there's an overlap here on your question. I think, I feel like it's the late 90s all over again. I think, I think it's like, you know, we haven't had the dot-com bust this time around, the crypto thing, the whole thing. It feels to me it's very, very similar to the late, to the late 90s. And I do believe there is a commodity boom coming. Six of the next 10 years, I think, are going to be awesome, all right? Where are those bad four years? Is it, you know, think of the 2000s. You know, in the middle of the 2000s, you had the GFC. You know, right in the middle of a 10-year boom, we had that, that bust, right? So where are those four years going to be? I don't know. But I suspect one of those not-so-good years could be this year. And so the most important thing is show me what state you're going to be in a year from now. What's your cash? What are you doing to hold on to cash? What level of certainty do you do relative to your peers? Are you not getting out too far in front of your skis? You know, look at the copper people give this massive copper vibe, but copper's not matching the narrative. And general equities are still outperforming mining equities. Mining equities are not yet loved like the late 90s. The, the, I, I put some charts up on presentations I've given in the last couple of years, the relative value of a basket of commodities versus the S&P. The last time it made a really significant low prior to the current one was in the in the late nineties. You know, gold uh, general equities were on a high, mining equities and, and commodities generally were on the low. You had the lowest level in the late nineties that you had since since the nineteen um, since the nineteen nineteen thirties. We we are much lower than that now. You know, commodities as a basket and commodity equities could double from here in a relative value sense to general equities and still be below the 1990 lows. I mean, the world has given up on mining. I think, was it, you, did you say it's a, someone said this morning, it's a sin, it's a sin trade. John Just Forward. Yeah, yeah. Gr- well, and, and, and there's yeah. a great and a great market analyst. I love, love, love his company, love what he does. Yeah, that's nuts. I mean, the whole world needs mining. And yet again, it's just like dot com. You know, I was a gold bull in the late 90s. I said, gold can't go down anymore. People said, well, when's it going to go up? So when blood, sweat and tears comes back into fashion, when people realize that you have to invest in capital and in people and actually make things, that's how economies grow. And so we're going to come back this whole, you know, whatever you think about the, the green revolution or whatever it is, you know, governments are mandating. The sooner they get out of mandating, let the market pick it up, I think, the better. But I don't think until generalist investors can't make money easier in general equities and in the stuff they're making money in now, mining is going to languish. We're going to sit here. We're going to kind of bubble. We're not going to get going until people go, oh, okay, well, those things are outperforming what was previously the, the stocks. And at the moment, Gold's a great example. John mentioned in his presentation this morning that, you know, I've got a thesis that it's very simple why gold is going up and gold equities aren't. Because the people with the money are only buying gold. I mean, the gold is going up because people who want to buy gold and would never buy a gold mining share are buying gold. Central banks are buying it. High net worths are buying it. Those high net worths might buy gold equities at some stage in the future, but only if they can see that gold equities are outperforming gold. Gold hasn't outperformed. Some CEOs will get annoyed about this because some gold stocks have outperformed the gold price in recent time. But as an industry, 
gold mining companies have not outperformed the gold price for at least a decade. You know, and so you look at that that industry. So those investors look around and go, "I'm just going to buy gold. It's easier. I don't have to take any country risk. I don't have to take management risk. I don't have to take risk. I'm going to buy gold." So those are the people buying gold. Now, gold price can keep going up. Those of us that like buying gold shares will see them be, become more profitable. Hopefully, they won't just increase the volumes and take the costs up, which they've got a terrible habit of doing. You know, the higher the gold price goes, the higher the cost to produce goes with it. But that's what's, um, I think that's what's exciting and gold is leading. But gold's also telling us that people are starting to get wear, wary about general equities. I think that's what gold's really sniffing out. You know, smart money is starting to go, I don't have to sell very much of these equities to buy quite a lot of gold. Um, so, yeah. Sure, we're at risk of getting into uh, our panel discussion <laughs> early. Uh, we'll leave it there, but I did have one more question. Just wanted to get your general thoughts on the conference so far, uh, Mining New Select Sydney. Uh, it's the first time we've run this one, had it in Perth, looking to build it into something a lot bigger. What are your thoughts on it uh, from your experience uh, today? I really like the panel discussions. I would say that I'm on a panel tomorrow. But no, I like the like the uranium have the conversation with the, the kind of industry experts then some uranium companies come and talk i think in that context it's great one thing that it does is it it liberates the managers from having to talk about their metal or their environment leave that to the experts leave that to the panel or whatever and just talk about your company and and so that's good I and mean, I, I like that that balance. I think that's a it's a really good balance. It has a very different feel than perhaps some of the other things where you feel like you know you you're being sold to all the time. We're actually having a discussion more about what the industry themes are, and here's some companies you might be able to capitalise on those themes. So it's a it's a good format. I like it. Thanks for joining us, Sean. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for the opportunity. Nice to see you.